So have you ever traveled for the holidays? Anybody ever taken a trip for the holidays? We got back late last night from visiting my in-laws in Arkansas. Uh, it was a, a fantastic time. Uh, had a had Whataburger in uh, Mississippi. Uh, had a burger at Milo's in Alabama. Um, I mean, it was good seeing my in-laws too, but I mean, I, I ate really, really good this week. Great, great trip. Fantastic trip. Um, but it was an interesting part. There was a moment where I'm driving through Alabama. We're I don't know, maybe 10, 15 minutes from, from Mississippi line. And, and I looked down and I had my GPS going through my phone. And on the screen, it was interesting because on the bottom half of the screen is this beautiful color satellite graphic of everything that's around me. And then all of a sudden, there's this diagonal cutoff in the screen. Uh, sorry, Earl and Tom, it, it wasn't that Mississippi wasn't there. I know it was there. Uh, but, but it was this thing as we're, you know, heading toward, there was just, it was just blackness. And so I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm starting to think, you know, what am I going to do, you know? I mean, it's the big one, Elizabeth, here we go. You know, I mean, it's, it's right here, right here. I mean, I, I was thinking, gosh, should I use the flux capacitor? Is that going to help me right now? You know, I can just, you know, go to another time. And, and, and really what I was kind of thinking was, well, I mean, if this is the end of the world as we know it, I, I really do feel fine because I know Jesus, you know, I'm, I'm good. So, so here we go. So, so we kept going and we kept going. And, and sure enough, I kind of held my breath when the, the blue dot that was, you know, our car moving down the interstate, when the blue dot got to that black line and we crossed into it, we did not disappear into the matrix. It was fantastic. I was just, I was so glad. I was so happy. And, and to celebrate, when we got a little farther down the road, we wanted to celebrate not escaping into oblivion. So uh, we stopped at Starbucks Tupelo and celebrated with some fancy coffee, you know, because that's a good thing to do when you think the end of the world is getting ready to happen. Now, the reality is, though, some of you, that wasn't an experience driving down the interstate. You, you actually had that experience this week. I mean, I, I have a friend of mine that, that Thanksgiving morning, you know, a, a pain that, that they weren't aware of and didn't think was coming. It, it just showed up first thing, Thanksgiving morning. You know, sometimes we're, we're cruising through life and all of a sudden there's, there's this blackness, this this black wall, this, this black hole, and, and, and we, we can't do anything about it. It's, it's just there. There's some person or there's some situation that, that we step into and, and we are overwhelmed with fear or worry or, or anger or, or a million other things. Today we're finishing up our, our series, Rope of Hope, and what we've been doing is walking through Psalm 42, finding a hope that we can grab a hold of no matter what is happening in life. And today our message is reaching for hope. And what the psalmist is going to do today is to help us find what we need the most when the black line begins to appear on the map of life. Let's see what the psalmist has to say. Psalm 42, verse 11. Why are you in despair, my soul? He's not having a bad day. He's not stuck in traffic. He's not unraveling Christmas lights. No, no, he is in despair. You know, there's some words that we should only use at at certain times. Despair is one of those words that we shouldn't use casually. Despair is one of those words that we use when we have no peace, none. We can't find it anywhere. We look, we, we try, we will, we'll turn to the movies or to a TV show or, or we'll turn to, to going shopping or, or golfing or hunting. I mean, we'll go try something, but none of it. Not vacations, not trimming the tree, no holiday songs, nothing will help. That's what the psalmist has experienced. Is he's experiencing a, a deep, deep despair. He has no peace his soul is deeply rattled. But it's not just rattled. Look what he says next in verse 11. And why are you restless within me? He's deeply rattled and he's deeply restless. Well, what does it mean to be restless? Well, I came across an interesting description of this through someone writing about what it means to be an American. It's very interesting. Here, here was the observation. 
The inhabitant of the United States attaches himself to the goods of this world as if he were assured of not dying. And he rushes so to grasp those goods that one would say he fears at each instant he will cease to live before he has enjoyed them. In other words, it's this feeling like you will live forever if you just get that promotion at work. If you just get that that new pair of boots or that new car or that new house or, or that one great special Christmas present. That Man, if I get that, everything is just roses. It's, it's great. I'll feel like I'm never going to die. Or if we don't get it, we feel like we're going to die a million deaths if we don't get it. Anxiety, impatience, restlessness for things. Does that sound familiar? Here's the interesting note. That quote was from a historian describing the average American in 1831. Anything new under the sun? This sense of of restlessness. Someone noted that his observation of an American is that consumption did not bring contentment and that riches did not bring rest. And 191 years later, is, is there anything different? Someone's going to lose their mind in the next few weeks trying to get that last Turbo Man toy for their kid, you know? or, or to, to get that picture uploaded online so they can get that customized bobblehead made of their Uncle Fitzroy, you know? We, we, we will lose our minds just trying to make sure that we can get the things, the, the holiday things, and it's not that they're bad. It's just that there's this sense of, of restlessness. We're, we're anxious, we're impatient, we're, we're restless if we can't get these things and have these things. And that sense of restlessness, you know what it does? It creates stressfulness. I don't know if that's a word, but, but it works. That, that restlessness creates stressfulness. And restless despair, it's much worse than looking for a toy. Restless despair, it, it casts us down. It leaves us rejected. It leaves us low in spirit. Our, our spirit, it, it falls. And what do we do when we feel rejected like that? Well, we turn to a lot of things, you know. We, we watch a movie or, or we go shopping or we go golfing or we go hunting. We, we go buy something. We go do something. We, we try to escape it. Maybe we even, you know, haul out the holly, you know, put up the tree before our spirit falls again, you know. And, and that's okay because, look, we, we need a little Christmas, you know, right this very minute, you know. The spin it and all that, that's great, you know, we need it. But what about when Christmas is over? See, this is, this is the first Sunday of Advent, this, this time when we begin to, to look at the birth of Jesus, not as just some, some cute holiday, but as this longing, come again, the long-expected Jesus. And so what do we do when Christmas is gone? Because when Christmas is gone, when the holidays are over, and in the deepest part of our soul, we don't need a little Christmas. We need a lot of Christ. A lot. The message from the angels on that first official real Christmas. This was the message, Luke 2, 11. Today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Not just a baby, not even just a king, but a savior, the savior of the world. Why do you need a savior? Here's why. Because none of us measure up. None of us. None of us have perfectly kept the law of God. The law of God through practical and and spiritual and emotional and even scientific encounters will discover a person can know that the law of God is the ultimate law that created and sustains the universe. And if we haven't perfectly kept that ultimate law, then a person is under the curse that comes from breaking that law. Isaac Watson 
writing paraphrase of, of Psalm 98 said this in Joy to the World. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. The curse from, from breaking the law. So how far does the curse go? How far is the curse found? How far does the wrath of God reach? Everywhere. There, there's no limit. This is what Jesus said in John chapter three. The one who believes in the son has eternal life. Great news. And then he continues. But the one who does not obey the son will not see life. And then he says this but the wrath of God remains on him. Look, haul out the holly, put the tree up, um, put the elf out on the shelf, you know, get out the eggnog, you know, do do whatever you gotta do. But ultimately, when it comes to the deepest need of our souls, the deepest need of our soul is that we need a savior. We, We desperately need a savior. And that savior will never be who you vote for, for president. And that savior will never be your pastor. And that savior will never be your spouse. And it'll never be your kids. And it'll never be your parents or your grandparents or your favorite actor or your favorite athlete or your BFF. There's only one savior of the world and that is Christ the Lord. There is no other savior, only Jesus. And without him, to be under the curse means that despair never ends. It means the curse is is never lifted. Jesus says the wrath of God remains on that person. That's not the Christmas spirit, right? And yet it is. But it doesn't have to be that way. See, the the hope of what it means to turn to Jesus is you no longer have to be a rebellious sinner. You no longer have to be a lost church member. You no longer have to be an apathetic atheist or, or just an angry legalist. The beauty of what it means to know Jesus is that you can turn to him and the story completely changes. That restless despair changes, and here's why. Because only Jesus can promise you that your spirit will not fall forever. Oh, it'll fall. It'll fall when when someone you love dies. It'll fall when when everything in your life begins to, to fall apart. When things are difficult at home or work or school, there will be moments where our spirit will fall. But in Christ, that does not have to be the end of the story. Jesus says there's one thing you can do right now to change restless despair forever. What is that one thing? Believe. Repent and believe in Jesus. Preach the gospel to yourself. I think sometimes we forget and we wonder what exactly it is that God is doing in the world. We look at things happening in the world and we think, well, well, surely God's messed up, you know? Surely God is is not doing the right thing. Surely God has has gotten things off kilter. Surely God is, is not paying attention to what's happening in the world. And yet, as Stacy said, to a thousand generations, to a thousand generations. This is what the Lord is doing. When I look at my life, I don't look at a life where I can say, well, I'm, I'm saved because of my works. I'm saved because of, of what I've done. You know? God doesn't look down on me and say, you know what, Dow, you're doing a pretty average job at Holland Avenue. You know, it's, it's so-so, but you know what? I'm gonna take your average work and I'm gonna let you enter into my heaven. And there are a lot of professing Christians and non-Christians alike that think that's how it's gonna work out. But but that's not how it's gonna shake out. There's not gonna be this moment where where God says, you know what, if if you were okay, look, did you pay your taxes? Come on in, you know. Did you buy nice Christmas presents? Come on in. That's it's nowhere in God's truth. And it's nowhere in the language of Jesus. 
Jesus was, was very clear. There's wrath that remains or there's belief that frees. There's belief that, that rescues. To, so to repent and believe on Jesus means that when God looks at us, he's not looking at our works. He sees our average stuff and he says, I'll accept you anyway because when I look at you, I don't really see you as much as I see Christ in you. I see you as my creation, but I also see that, that my son has rescued you, that you've received him. So my wrath is erased. The, the curse is lifted. And now you can enter in to my heaven. See, the definition of the life of a believer is, is not in our accomplishments. The definition of our life is in Christ. We have Christ. He becomes the reality and the definition of who we are. But the psalmist didn't have Christ, right? I mean, it's, it's going to be another 979 years before Jesus is even born. So, so what does he have? What, what's the definition of his life? Like the next part of verse 11. He says this, wait for God, for I will again praise him. Why? For the help of his presence, my God. The psalmist is full of despair. I mean, he's having a moment. It's, it's a dark moment. Things are, things are really bad. And he's engaged in this, but as he's engaged, he's remembering something. He's remembering the message that God gave the enemy at the beginning of the world. And that message was, you won't win. Your, your head's going to be bruised permanently. You won't win. The victory is, is not yours. See, I'm sending one who's coming to make his blessings known far as the curse that just came into the world will be found, which is everywhere. And so the psalmist, he's, he's bewildered, he's rattled, he's full of despair, and he's writing some stuff down in his journal, and he's like, man, soul, why, why are you in such despair? Why are you so disturbed? Why are you so sad? Yes, soul, this is hard. Yes, this, this is tough. Yes, you're having a hard time sleeping. You're having a hard time thinking. There's times where you're, you're crying yourself to sleep at night. Soul, we're angry. Soul, we're in despair. But then in, in the middle of that, he has this little interjection in his mind. And he says, but soul, so we have God. We have God. God has saved us. The great I am has saved us. The one who was in the beginning, who was and is and is to come, he saved us. And that God saved us with an everlasting love and he promised a Messiah. A Messiah that was going to come to save the world. And he's proven that his promises are true over and over and over again. So soul... Wait for God. Wait for God. Hope in God. He is trustworthy. The psalmist wasn't just wishing on a star. No, he was reaching out with confident hope. I heard something yesterday that said if you're, if you're bored with God or if you feel like you need a new word from God, they said, I mean, did you run out? Because in the pages of the Bible, not only is there enough excitement over the character of God to last us this lifetime, it's what we'll be doing forever. I was talking with someone a few weeks ago and, and we were just talking about spiritual matters and, and I told them one of the reasons that that's a struggle for us is because we don't believe God will satisfy us. What do you mean? I was like, we don't think being with God forever is going to be that good. And they're like, wait, what do you mean? That sounds crazy. I said, no, it's very true. We don't believe that being with God will be satisfying. And she said, why? Get ready to hurt all of our feelings, okay? I'm going to tell you this before I say it, all right? She said, why? I said, because of Carolina and Clemson and Thanksgiving 
and Christmas and Halloween and a new house and a new car and a great cheeseburger in Mississippi. We are convinced that this world is it. And it's not. It never has been. And the beauty of the gospel is when our life is falling apart. And listen, I know people this week that their life fell apart and it wasn't a football game. Their life fell apart on a holiday week. And in that moment, what we need is the God who blesses for a thousand generations. That, that's, that's who we worship today. That's, that's who we're singing to, the psalmist. The psalmist was like, my life is falling apart. I am full of despair, but I know what I need to do. I see the dark line coming on the GPS, but I know what's beyond the darkness. My God is there. My God who was and is and is to come. My God who will satisfy me forever even though it doesn't feel like it right now. I'm going to hope in that God. I'm going to wait for that God. Sir Harry Lauder was a Scottish entertainer. On December 28, 1916, his only son was killed in battle in World War I. When he found out, he, he turned to a friend of his who was with him at the moment, and this is what Sir Harry said. When a man comes to a thing like this, there are just three ways out of it. There is drink, there is despair, and there is God. By his grace, the last is for me. By his grace... The last is for me. The reality is, we may not see it on our GPS, but the darkness will come. We won't see it ahead of time, but, but the darkness will come one way or the other for every single one of us in this room. We will have a moment of despair. Some of you have already had some, and that God of a thousand generations has, has helped you along but the despair will come. And so right now, today, in this moment, choose how you're going to make it through it. Choose God. But make it your choice today that of all the different things that you could turn to, today, this Sunday after Thanksgiving, the, the first Sunday of the Advent season in 2022, make it your passion to say, I'm going to make, through, make it through with God. This God that I'm going to wait for, this God that has promised over and over again, and he keeps his promises day after day, week after week, generation after generation. And before, during, and after your despair, wait for God, hope in God, because I promise only God is the truest and deepest source of salvation. He is our only salvation. And in him, we can reach out with confident hope that our spirit will not fall forever.